Our topic tonight, you know, uh, wither Russia. What difference does it make to us? Uh, now, of course, nearly everybody has a dozen answers to that question very quickly, and we're all aware of the, the remaining power of the Soviet Union as a great nuclear power. Her economic strength is enormous. Her impact upon her neighbors is great. Uh, uh, she influences both Europe and, and Asia, and uh, her current uh, restlessness uh, displays itself in a certain exuberance of self-expression, uh, in, 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 including Syria. Uh, but uh, we're very fortunate. We have one of the nation's truly outstanding authorities on Russia. Uh, Robert Legvold is Professor Emeritus from Columbia University, where he's had a distinguished uh, career. Uh, he's a graduate of the Fletcher School of International Law and Diplomacy. He taught for almost a decade at Tufts. Uh, then was with the Council on Foreign Relations, where he headed their Russian studies, uh, Soviet studies program, and then joined the faculty at Columbia, where he headed the, the very prestigious Harriman Institute, and uh, was a, a, a diligent student of the former Soviet states. And if you look at the books he's written and the articles, you'll see that he's written on almost every one of the, or at least a large number of those states. Uh, both in Central Asia and, and on the borders of, the, of Russia uh, to the west. Uh, the, uh, a after uh, his career at Columbia, he's continued to play a very important role in the United States' attention to foreign affairs. And he uh, was the director of a program uh, under the auspices, I think, of the American Academy of Sciences uh, for rethinking U.S. policy toward Russia. And then he also headed up, I think under the auspices of Carnegie, uh, a program on uh, Euro-Atlantic security relations, both of those having a significant impact upon American policy and on the thought processes of, uh, of Europeans as, as well. Uh, he's been honored appropriately in his career. Uh, he's a member of, uh, I should say, he served on a number of advisory boards, including Mr. Gorbachev's advisory board on uh, international peace and democracy. And uh, he's a member of the American Academy of Sciences, and he is a, uh, a foreign fellow of the Russian Institute uh, Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, it, it's been truly a wonderful career. It's still vital and active, and it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Professor Legvold. Uh, thank you, Frank. I think it was George Burns who said, uh, I don't deserve that introduction, but then I have arthritis and I don't deserve that either. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be back in Baltimore. This is my second time. Uh, and the second time working with Frank, it has to be 10 years or more. We were trying to remember when. So I've had this pleasure of this view and of this group uh, before. And so I know what to expect and I look forward to it with pleasure. I've come here this evening, as Frank said, to address two questions. The one is, where is Russia going? And the other is, what's it to us? And I want to start with the second question, because I think that's really where the core of the problem is. Uh, Frank said that everyone appreciates what is the power that's still retained by this Russia successor to the Soviet Union. I'm not sure, however, in fact, I'll argue for you, that most of us, beginning with our national leadership and our parliamentarians, are not nearly as focused, at least not in a way that they articulate on what the real stakes are in the U.S.-Russia relationship. Uh, so as a result, the issue is fading, and it's unusual now for world affairs councils, let alone newspapers or other organizations, to focus on Russia, rather than China or the Asia Pacific or Islam or the Middle East and the Arab Spring or the rest of it. Russia's simply faded in that context. And I think a lot of people would say, well, why not? After all, this country that once was a very serious rival of the United States when it was the Soviet Union is now a country with an economy that's 12 percent of ours. Uh, our national economy, GDP, is 15 trillion dollars. They are considerably under 2 trillion dollars as an economy. They are 13 percent of what we spend on defense. 
They spend $90 billion a year on defense. That's a rapidly growing sum, but we spend $682 trillion or billion on defense. Uh, and as a result, well, we are really outclassing everybody. That $682 billion, as you know, many of you know, uh, is larger than the total defense spending of the next 14 countries that spend on defense. It is 40% of the defense spending in the entire world. So the fact that the Russians are 13% doesn't distinguish them enormously from most other countries in the world. But why, again, worry about this Russia when, in addition to what I've just said, it's a country that's beset with health and educational and fundamental infrastructural and even demographic problems. A people of 140 million that's shrinking, shrank again this year for the 20th straight year. And above all else, because this is what really put the Soviet Union at the center of our attention, the threat of nuclear Armageddon has disappeared. And it was the threat of nuclear Armageddon that indisputably made the Soviet Union a country that mattered to us, mattered more than virtually any other country. But in truth, I believe, uh, and Frank began to suggest that, I believe that Russia does matter. I believe that Russia matters a lot in U.S. foreign policy, and I think that's the problem. Because I don't believe leadership in this country or in that country, going back to Bush Sr. through Clinton, through Bush Jr., uh, even in many respects the Obama administration, let alone Yeltsin, Putin, Medvedev, Putin, have ever done much of a job of persuading their peoples, persuading us in the United States or Russians on the Russian side, that the other country really, really matters to one another. It tends to be a kind of uh, fragmentary reference to the way in which the other country matters. And in part, I think this problem is because they haven't persuaded themselves. How can they persuade you and me if they themselves are not convinced, whatever their language may be, that the other country matters in the way in which I believe it does. Uh, but let me lay out my argument of why the country matters. And if you buy that, then other things I have to say tonight will follow. If you don't buy it, then much of what I have to say in the remaining part of my comments aren't going to be convincing to you either. That is why we should then do something about it, why we ought to invest in an important way, why we ought to really care, why we ought to make our policymakers and our parliamentarians pay attention to why we care. The first is the obvious. It's in terms of global governance, at least global governance when it comes to the tinderboxes, to Iran, the nuclear weapons program, uh, to making the institutions that we want more effective so that we're not lone rangers or operating only with coalitions of the willing in dealing with Iran, sanctions, and the rest of it. We need Russia. We need Russia to make the Security Council, and China, to make the Security Council work. They are among the P5, the permanent five. Uh, and they have come some distance in the last several years on sanctions on Iran, but not far enough. In the end, if there's going to be a solution to that problem or progr progress on that problem through negotiation, we're going to need the Russians. We're also going to need the Chinese along the way. That is true, and Frank alluded to it, in the case of Syria, where we see Russia as a part of the problem rather than a part of the solution. And it is true that Russia is in no position to prevent the U.S. or our European allies from doing what we choose to do. If we choose to arm the opposition, which is what we're talking about now, or operate no-fly zones, the Russians can't stop that. But if we want a negotiated outcome in Syria, the Russians are absolutely essential to getting it. That's what's motivating John Kerry at this point as Secretary of State. And the same thing is true in the case of North Korea. The Chinese are the key actors in North Korea and its nuclear weapons program. But the Russians and the Chinese operate hand in glove when it comes to their policies in many of these areas, including North Korea. And I think the Chinese, while they are the decisive actor between the two, and in, indeed in many ways among the six that have been dealing with the problem, if the Russians were to align themselves more closely with uh, the West's position or the other four countries that are concerned about the issue, I think it would influence the Chinese. So at this first level, in terms of global governance, we really need Russian cooperation. 
I might say that, or must say that, and all the things that I'm about to say, I can turn it around and I would do this where I, in Moscow, speaking to a Russian audience and say, they need U.S. cooperation to deal with many of these problems. That's the only way the idea of working on this relationship would make sense. If it were simply a one-way street, I wouldn't have much of an argument this evening. Russia, second, is the world's largest, has the world's largest proven gas reserves, 25 percent of the world's supply. Uh, they are the world's largest gas exporter. They have the largest uh, supplies of, potential supplies of the new fad in energy, which is shale gas. They will have the largest share of the Arctic hydrocarbon reserves, which is 17 percent of uh, the Earth's reserves, we think, at this point. Uh, they are the principal supplier for our critical allies in Europe. Europe is 36 percent dependent on Russia for its gas. Uh, they, are, uh, they are the second largest supplier of coal, and they are Europe's largest supplier of coal. Again, our critical alliance. Uh, a gas dependency on the part of the Europeans that is expected to grow, whatever may be the current downturn and indeed the pressures on energy prices because of the economic recession and because of shale and because of a number of other things that are coming on market. If we're going to get a handle, third, if we're going to get a handle on climate change, Russia is an important part of the problem because they are either third or fourth among the leading emitters of greenhouse gas. Uh, it's either India or Russia, it varies, depending on the rhythm of their economy. Head of the class is the United States and China. And among the four, only the U.S. is declining in gas emission. The other, the other three are all increasing. And the Russians are likely to not increase as rapidly as the Chinese are, but likely to increase more rapidly than India in the future if their economy continues to grind on. After... China, it is the most serious source of illicit trade in international politics and the hardships that it imposes in terms of um, illicit trade in arms and drugs, in counterfeit goods, in laundered money, in human organs, in endangered species, and uh, in human trafficking above all those human trafficking, with the consequences, the way in which that links to regional conflicts, as we saw in the Balkans, around Yugoslavia, Serbia, and the rest of it. Cybersecurity. There's a big three when it comes to this rather shapeless, broad continuum of, of cybersecurity. I tend to divide it between what is cyber crime, the kind of thing that all of us worry about, our hacked computers and corporations that worry about the espionage that gets done that way. That's a legitimate concern. It's a large concern. <clears throat> and the Russians, by the way, are very much at the forefront of that as well. The attention in the last couple of weeks have been on China, uh, has been on China because of, uh, because of all the news of the uh, cyber intrusions on the part of the Chinese, particularly the Chinese military, in terms of our defense developments and other key areas. But if you look at the far end of this spectrum of cyber threats, cyber security, it is what I call cyber warfare. The capacity of countries through cyber essentially to conduct war by destroying another country's major infrastructure, whether it's the intelligence and IT networks that make our formal defense systems operate, or whether it's our water systems in cities or our air control systems within the country. And there are only three countries at this point that are capable of doing that on a large scale. We're probably the leader in capacity to do it. The Chinese are there and the Russians are there. So if we're actually going to deal with that high-end part of the problem, cyber warfare, which you need to think about is simply the alternative to the way in which we have fought war. Were we to fight a hot war, it now would have a cyber dimension. And the three countries that can do that are the United States, China, and Russia. So if we're going to get a handle on that, the way in which we thought about trying to find ways of creating regime and control and negotiating arms control in the case of nuclear weapons, again, Russia is important. Uh, all of this, all of this before we get to the sixth, uh, 
reason that I'm offering you, and that is nuclear weapons. Uh, the fact that nuclear Armageddon is gone, the fact that your grandchildren are no longer being prepared in schools that have these yellow plaques with the black that shows you where you're supposed to go in a civil defense drill or being trained to do something in the context of nuclear attack isn't by any means the end of the story because the progress in this area continues with the United States and potentially Russia leading but now with China playing a major factor. It includes the weaponization of space. It includes what is called prompt global strike which is being able to use conventional weapons to do the damage of nuclear weapons within 30 minutes or 60 minutes anywhere on Earth, which also then begins to blur the threshold of knowing who's got what doing what in these circumstances. And there are a series of other developments in this area that are important. The United States and Russia still have 95% of the world's nuclear weapons, and it's about 50-50 at this point. It's a world now that has eight, or depending on how you define it, nine nuclear powers. Uh, and that means it's a multipolar nuclear world. If we're going to begin trying to get some control over that, because there are many very unstable elements in it, they exist in the bilateral nuclear relationship between India and Pakistan. There is an extended version of that, or an extended manifestation of that, in India's China relationship. Uh, that doesn't often get talked about. There is China that's responding to a complicated world of nuclear powers that includes Russia, it includes India, and includes the United States. That world, if we are to get some kind of a regime, some kind of control over that, uh, if you will, multilateral nuclear arms control as opposed to what we've known for the last 40 years, which is bilateral nuclear arms control, it'll have to be led by the U.S. and Russia. They're the only ones that are capable of taking the initiative. And that's true also in the other area that now has risen to rival the problem of the nuclear haves, what I've just been talking about. That is the nuclear have-nots. That's where our attention is really focused. It's the issue of nuclear proliferation and the securing of nuclear materials. And the most dangerous nuclear materials to secure are in Russia or the post-Soviet region, Kazakhstan and other parts of the former Soviet Union. So again, the U.S.-Russia leadership in addressing what remains potentially a very dangerous nuclear world that we've stopped thinking about because Armageddon is no longer on our mind, involves the Russians. Those are the obvious reasons why I would argue that Russia is important to us today. The less obvious reasons in many ways are the most profound, but they're also the reasons that reach farthest into the future and therefore are the most difficult for us to seize, let alone act on. The first of those is thinking about what this world is becoming when we can think beyond an Afghan war or the, the civil war in Syria or Italian bond markets or what's happening to the euro in general. Uh, that is what this world is going to look like a decade from now or two decades from now. There's been a very unusual feature to international politics since the end of the Cold War. It's one that's quite contrary to all of modern international relations history going back to the 17th century, say to 1648, Treaty of Westphalia, what we saw in the 19th century before. And that is the absence of what I would call strategic rivalry among the major powers, which always drove international politics through those subsequent centuries. By strategic rivalry among the major powers, I mean when one or more major power defines one or more other major powers as the principal national security threat. When one or more major power arms, creates a defense policy, creates a defense establishment to deal with one or more other great powers, and when one or more great powers creates alignments or alliances that are intended to address the threat that is posed by one or more other great powers. That's been missing since the end of the Cold War. I call it the blessing. Now one of the things we worry about, unless you are one of these optimists and believe the world, as Tom Friedman would put it, is flat and that an independent world now makes it impossible for countries to get back to, major countries to get back to the kind of rivalry that could eventually lead to war. Uh, unless you believe that kind of thing and that the world is now fundamentally different from what it's been for the last 300 years, then the question of preserving the blessing is a very important one in foreign policy. I think the first and most important challenge, and we see it, it's why Obama had that informal conversation uh, 
uh, with Xi Jinping out in the Annenberg Estate in California this last week to begin talking about it. Because where it'll begin, where we'll begin to lose the blessing in its most important way is, a re is the development of a U.S.-China strategic rivalry. And strategic rivalry, by the way, if I can say parenthetically, will do enormous damage in international politics, even if it doesn't mean we get to World War III or we're not back to where we were with the Russians and worrying about Berlin crises and that kind of thing. The mere fact of the strategic rivalry, where we begin focusing on one another as more the enemy than a potential partner, will wreak havoc on the international system. And Russia is the other. Not globally, Russia's not capable, given all those figures I started with, of a rival being a rival for the U.S. globally. They can make some mischief in Latin America. They can create problems for us in various parts of the world, beginning with the Middle East, but not in a serious way on a global scale. But they sure as hell can within an important region that matters to us, which is Eurasia. And Eurasia is the hinterland of the regions that really do matter to us, East Asia and Europe. And therefore, preserving the blessing, first with the Chinese, but then secondly with the Russians, is very important for what this world is going to look like 10 years from now, 15 years from now. That, in turn, is related to what I think is happening in international politics today. Most of uh, international politics in the 20th century, going back to the period before the First World War and then what was created coming out of the Second World War, even through much of the 19th century, was an international system in which Europe was its axis. After the Second World War, the axis was essentially Euro-Atlantic. It was NATO-Warsaw Pact. It was the U.S. with our European allies, uh, Russia and those countries that it had commandeered in Eastern Europe. A lot of the action, the violence, was out in the Third World precisely because it was too dangerous to do it, as we learned in the, both the Berlin crises and the last extended Berlin crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Too dangerous to do it there. But the axis was the Euro-Atlantic, Euro uh, if you will. Now we all know that we have the rise of the Asia-Pacific, Asia-Pacific region, and the importance of China within that context, but not only China, India and other parts of Asia, including still Japan. And therefore, I think the world that we're moving into, the world of my grandchildren, maybe even of my children, uh, is going to be a two-axis system. It is going to be, it's not going to, Europe is not going to be displaced by the Asia Pacific. Uh, Euro-Atlantic is deeply divided at this point, and that's part of the problem because we've got Russia that is feuding over the direction of NATO, and we're worried about whether the Russians are reliable gas suppliers for Western Europe that has the kind of dependency that I mentioned earlier, and we've got some of the frictions and ongoing protracted conflicts in the post-Soviet space including the remnants of what happened in the Russia-Georgia War in 2008, but also in Karabakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Transnistria within Moldova, a lot of things that prevent this part of the world, this axis, this historic axis, from having triumphed uh, over what was the Cold War and created an inclusive, cooperative, Euro-Atlantic security community. But I believe that's still going to be a critical, uh, either fragmented or more unified and more inclusive axis of the new international system. And I believe the way in which that area unfolds is going to be heavily important, will, be heavily, uh, uh, will weigh heavily on the way in which all of us deal with the rise of the Asia Pacific. Think about the two major powers, there are only two, that are directly involved in both of those critical areas that I'm calling the two axes, Asia Pacific and the Euro-Atlantic, the United States and Russia. And therefore, the extent to which the United States and Russia can cooperate with other critical participants in the Euro-Atlantic, and the United States and Russia can cooperate with critical participants in Asia Pacific, Japan, China, and by extension India, will, depend, will determine very heavily what the world is going to look like 10 or 15 years from now. And if we're not cooperating in Europe, and if we have begun fragmenting, not only do we endanger the blessing, but we minimize the chance of dealing well with this great transformation that's going to occur at the very heart, the very essence of the international system. Uh, there's a third thing I would mention in passing. Uh, it's hard to uh, 
weigh it, and it's certainly hard to argue for you that it's imminent or that it's within hand, but it is the opportunity of seeing Russia and the neighboring states, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, the three within the Caucasus, uh, Belarus for that matter, succeed. Uh, we know what it's meant to the international economy, the global economy, to see the rise first of the tigers, and then after that, China. Uh, we know how dependent we are now on the dynamism of China. I would argue that potentially the next major generational transformation of the global economy is potentially what could happen if these societies are successful economically and what that will do for the global economy, given both their human and natural, and natural wealth. Uh, and I don't mean only Russia. I mean also, as I say, other territories. And the territories are, are immense. It's hard for us to imagine. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, you know the size of Russia and its time zones and all of that. But if I tell you that you're in the city of Uralsk, which is in the northwest corner of Kazakhstan, you are closer to Warsaw than you are to Almaty in the southeast corner of Kazakhstan. So the territory out there, what it's occupying at the hinterland of East Asia, South Asia, the Islamic South, and Europe is utterly immense. So what difference does it make to the rest of the world that that part of the world succeed, that it not go the way of other continents that have not met the expectations that we had for them in the post-war period? Okay, let me move on quickly now to, uh, uh, to uh, where Russia is going with its foreign policy and I'll do that quickly. I, if one were to try to put a constructive note or description to Russian foreign policy at this point, because I'm rather critical of Russian foreign policy and its practical manifestations, the things that they're actually doing, it would be a commitment to strategic interdependence. And my Russian colleagues will use that notion. They'll argue that the commitment, even those that are critical of Putin will say that what Russia is really about these days is strategic independence. They don't want to be dependent on, they don't want to be aligned with anyone, even the Chinese in that context, even though they're leaning in that direction. As one of, uh, one of these very fine Russian analysts, Dmitry Trenin, has said, Russia intends to be at the center of its own solar system, and that solar system is basically the former Soviet space, and then they'll deal with China from its solar system, the center of it, or Europe, or the United States, or NATO, or whatever else you want to think about. Uh, the, the part that disturbs me the most is that, especially in the last several years, and since Putin has returned to the presidency, uh, is a distancing from the West itself. Um, rather than, a, if you will, a multi-vectored equally balanced policy toward the West, Europe, the United States, and China on the other hand. And were I a Russian leader, that's what I would be trying to do. I'd be trying to have good relations with China. I'd be trying to have good relations with the U.S. and with Europe. Good reasons for wanting to do that. But rather than that kind of balance, there's been a distancing, even a kind of alienation on his part. Originally, it was basically strategic, where Putin and his colleagues began arguing that Russia was uh, not going to be the junior partner of the United States or NATO, then became increasingly alienated from those, began arguing that U.S. commitments to unipolarity made no sense. They were committed to a multipolar world, which was essentially designed for undoing American preponderance, at least the effect of American preponderance in international politics. Uh, but lately, he had, and, but all through this, he would make the argument that, but Russia really is, in terms of its underlying values, as it has been for two centuries, a part of the West. It may be conflicted, it may have been a uh, turbulent struggle on the part of the Russians and their identity, going back to the Tsars, to sort out their relationship with the West, Westernizers versus Slavophiles and the rest of it, but it was all with respect to the West. Uh, and Putin would say until a year or two ago that in fact Russia's values were the same as the West. We simply have to go about those in a Russian way. A lot of people on the outside, as we saw the crackdowns, uh, assumed that in fact they were no longer Western values in the way in which they were being applied. But in the last year or so, he's been talking about now the importance of civilizational contrast in international mm -hmm. politics and the fact that the Russians have that the value system within the West is anemic, uh, often hypocritical, uh, 
no longer compelling and that in many ways, and this is a strain in Russian history, that in many ways Russia represents a superior value system and he'll focus on He'll focus on Russian orthodoxy. He'll focus on community as opposed to individualism. He'll focus on a number of other things along these lines, whatever it means. It's sort of foggy. Therefore, as one Russian has said, earlier Russia left the West strategically. Now Russia is leaving the West mentally. I don't believe that because anyone who knows anything of Russian history knows that the interaction with the response to the West going back to, if you will, Ivan Grozny, or Ivan the Terrible, and up through Peter and the others, has always been with respect to the West. I also know that most of the major figures in Russia that have their wives and their children in the West, they have them in, uh, they have them in uh, Cyprus and Greece and the Azores, they don't have them in China or in Singapore or elsewhere. Uh, it's the Russians that are driving up the real estate market in London, they're not driving up the real estate market in Hong Kong at this point, uh, and so on. So I, I don't, I think there's a limit to how far it can go. But in fact, uh, the Russians now are stressing the importance of the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, South Africa as part of that. They are emphasizing increasingly the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as where they want the action to be. And they're doing it for two reasons. The first I've already given you, the notion that Western values are, as I've said, anemic or even, uh, uh, even undesirable uh, from the Russian point of view. But the second reason is that the Russians are increasingly persuading themselves coming out of 2008 and the economic crisis, especially the problem of the EU these days, that the West, including the United States, is a fading force. China, India are the rising powers in international politics. And therefore, there's a question of how much you want to sacrifice in order to have cooperation with descending powers as opposed to those that they see on the ascent. Uh, I think it's, A, partly a misreading, but I think it's also a part bluster because when Putin went last to the BRICS conference in South Africa about two or three months ago, I think he figured out that, in fact, Russia still needs the West. Medvedev in 2010 gave a speech to the ambassadors in the foreign ministry in which he made strong appeal for developing the relationship with the West. He said, I quote him here, he said, we need special alliances for modernization, the economic front, problem that I'll say a word about in a moment. We need special alliances for modernization, first of all, with Germany, France, Italy, the EU in general, and with the United States. He didn't mention China in that speech, because when it comes to the question of modernizing the Russian economy, Investment will come from the West. It's not going to come from China or from other BRICs for that matter. Uh, okay. Uh, if, the, uh, if the stakes are this high, uh, well, even before that, let me, because I almost skipped over it. So what are the two fundamental problems with what's going on domestically within within Russia, or what are the problems? I think they are two fundamental problems. The first that I would point to is what I call the degeneration of the dual state. Russia under Putin, uh, coming out of the relative chaos of the Yeltsin years, uh, ended up creating, in effect, a dual state. One was, one part of it is an administrative regime, which is the Putinism part, the vertical, this power structure that he's created, all around him, heavily focused on him, and the other is the uh, the constitutional uh, the constitutional state. So rather than consolidating the rule of law uh, or the authority of constitutional institutions such as the parliament, making a creating a meaningful parliament in terms of its actions, uh, or modern forms of governments, they have essentially strengthened as I say, the administrative regime, which is, to put it in plainer language, uh, a concentration of power that acts uh, without, in its own discretion, without limitations, and normally uh, by suborning a legal system and using it uh, to their own purposes. Uh, it's a highly personalized system and therefore weakly institutionalized, with the presidency and Putin at the very center of it. The uh, reason why it gets called Putinism, not just Putin in these circumstances. And it worked so long as the regime was able to uh, dictate the social contract. The social contract under Putin was basically 
we will provide you with an ever-improving uh, real wage and income, and you, in the meantime, won't make political noise or create political opposition or challenge us along that front. Uh, and that was fine until 2008. Uh, per capita GDP in Russia from 1999 to 2011 increased fourfold. How many countries can say that's what happened to their population? Since 2008, the increment has, the total increment from 2008 to 2011 has been $900 per year. It's now uh, 17,000. In the prior years from 99, when things were really moving well, those increments were $1,000 a year, $2,000 a year in terms, of, in terms of per capita GDP, what people were experiencing in their, in their lives. So the key figure is fourfold increase over a little more than a decade during that period that has leveled off when you look at the charts since 2008. The source of that increase was what was happening with energy prices from 35 to 72 to eventually up to $147 a barrel. Uh, it provides 45% to 50% of federal or of government revenues within the country. The social contract that Putin maintains, the economic side of it, what he will deliver to them, is heavily dependent on those energy reserves or returns, as I say, 50% of the budget. This has uh, had a second unfortunate effect. This dual state with what I call the administrative regime that's been strengthened at the expense of the constitutional state gets in the way of uh, what's necessary to modernize the economy. Uh, that is the kind of structural reform that's necessary to move it beyond this monocultural character, that is this heavy dependency on commodities above all else, energy. Uh, the second thing that it does in these circumstances is uh, it um, inevitably preserves, even extends corruption within the country, and corruption becomes a further corroding factor that, that is an obstacle to modernization and structural change that will allow them, notice what I've been saying about the way that power structure is built in the country, what the nature of the social contract is that's now threatened in these circumstances. I could go on with many ways of representing the corruption, but one that may be more meaningful to you is um, those 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi going to cost the Russians $51 billion. You know what most Olympics have cost, London otherwise? 14, 14 billion. The estimate is that the corruption premium is $30 billion. Uh, the other part of this is the dependency, as I said, on energy revenues. In 2008, the Russian budget balanced on $55 a barrel oil. Today, the estimate, the high estimate, is that it balances on $120 a barrel oil, at a minimum $100 a barrel oil. And without that, the social contract is fundamentally threatened that I've been describing for you. In May 2008, Gazprom, this sprawling giant that controls gas, this monopoly of gas production, uh, had, was, the, was a valuable company, the most valuable company, one of the world's most valuable. It had a market capitalization of $369 billion. And Alexei Miller at that point was saying, boasting that it would be the first company in the world to reach a capitalization of a trillion dollars. Today, Gazprom is worth $83 billion. 369 to 83. Why? Mismanagement and corruption. Mismanagement and corruption. So, uh, in, this, in this circumstance where I've described both the problem and uh, the direction of Russia in terms of uh, the domestic side and then the foreign policy, what to do? What to do when the stakes are this if you agree with me, I said at the outset, if you agree with me, then what I have to say now is more meaningful. If you don't agree with me in terms of the stakes I laid out for you, then what I'm about to say in these concluding comments is not going to be very convincing. Uh, when the stakes are this high and the obstacles to building a closer Russia relationship are as great as they are because of what we all know, 
around Putin and the problems that are within that country, including some of the problems with our own that we can talk about. I won't now, but we can talk about it in the conversation. What do you do? I think, I think there are four things that, um, five things actually that I would, uh, that I'd recommend. The first is that the U.S. government, I'd recommend the same thing to the Russians, but that's, that's for them to recommend and do, that we develop a strategic vision that's practical of where we want the U.S.-Russia relationship to be five years from now. In the project that Frank mentioned on rethinking U.S. policy toward Russia, uh, and when we worked on it, we worked on it closely with the outgoing Bush administration and then the incoming Obama administration. The Obama administration, and they listened to this notion of uh, strategic vision, but they had a different way, Obama and his advisors, had a different way of thinking about what they wanted from the relationship. When, remember, Vice President Biden's phrase at the Munich Security Conference, the reset, the reset in U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, and what were the benchmark? well, essentially what they did was set a series of benchmarks of what would be success in the relationship. So that became then the target that oriented foreign policy. There were basically four benchmarks. The first was that we get a follow-on agreement to the expiring START agreement, the Nuclear Arms Control Agreement that expired December 5th, 2009, and we got the new uh, START agreement that we have, at the, that we got uh, a little later than that, but in 2010. The second was that the Russians be more cooperative with us in the UN in tightening the sanctions, and we got 19, the resolution 1929, and the Russians cooperated. The third was that we got further, we would get further cooperation from the Russian in what's called the Northern Distribution Network, but it's the way in which we supply the war in Afghanistan beyond the troubled supply links across Pakistan and a few others that flow in other directions, and we got that. And the fourth was something that I think most people don't know much about, but has been important, certainly important to the Obama administration, and that is Obama's idea of bringing the countries around the world together in order to create a tighter regime for controlling nuclear materials. Uh, high, highly enriched uranium in the labs and uh, in nuclear reactors and the like. Uh, and they've had two of those meetings they needed. Uh, they'll have a third uh, fairly shortly. But when they went into this, they expected the Russians to cooperate, and that was going to be a test where the Russians cooperated. And the Russians did all of that. So the way in which the Obama administration set the standards for the reset was in terms of benchmarks. What we were arguing is Think about it differently. Start with the notion of where do you want this relationship to be five years from now in realistic terms, not idealistic, flight of fancy, pie in the sky terms. Where do you want this relationship to be five years from now? What do you want to accomplish? And we argue that in order to do that kind of thing, you needed to begin with a serious strategic dialogue in which both sides, quietly, at a very high level, without over-bureaucratizing it within the two governments, sit down and talk seriously about the things that really bother them, what the problems are, and see whether we can't have an honest conversation, strategic dialogue about key issues in the relationship, and then figure out what steps need to be taken in order to mitigate the problems along the way. The further purpose of that strategic dialogue in pursuit of a strategic vision, as I described it, was to begin reducing the very high levels of mistrust. If you believe that the Cold War is over, then you don't know what's going on in the mindset on both sides, whether it's the U.S. Senate or whether it's a number of people, especially in the security establishment on the, Rus on the Russian side. Uh, the reason the Russians are reacting to NATO and missile defense in Europe the way they are is because that's still a Cold War attitude. They're still thinking in Cold War terms. Uh, and the reason why Senate, uh, senators sent a letter to Obama and said you better not do a deal with Russia on missile defense is because we know at the first opportunity they'll transfer the technology to Iran. So don't you do a deal. That's Cold War thinking again <laughs> along the way. That's still very much alive and a purpose of a strategic dialogue is to begin reducing that level of mistrust. The only way you can do that is by getting people to engage and talk to one another uh, along those lines. Uh, that also means that in your doing this with a strategic vision, you need to begin thinking about new things. Where do we have to break out of the bilateral relationship and develop a trilateral relationship that's cooperative? U.S., Russia, China. Well, we certainly have to do it on climate change. We're going to have to do it if we begin moving in the direction of dealing with a multipolar nuclear world with multilateral negotiations. We're going to have to have effective 
trilateralism, if you will, and you need to begin thinking about it. That kind of uh, exploration without negotiating agreements, you dealt with some specific problems, but without negotiating specific issues is precisely what this very well-planned, this very well-intentioned meeting between uh, Xi Jinping and uh, President Obama was all about in California. Uh, that needs to be followed up with something that's systematic, but that we continue doing that uh, with China and do the same thing with, uh, with Russia. Second thing is to create an overarching agenda with a few key salient items on it of what in this business of where, where do you want this relationship to be five years from now. I would argue that they would include ways in which the U.S. with other important partners can work with Russia in order to improve energy security in international politics so that we don't have to worry about gas cutoffs to Western Europe, but where the Russians also have some greater, <coughs> excuse me, some greater security over price and market along the way. We need to create something that's equitable between the sides. Uh, for the moment, that pressure has disappeared because everybody's declined economy has, has reduced the pressure on, on energy prices and energy supply. But before that, remember, we were worried about how everything is being distorted by the rise of China's energy requirements and oil and otherwise. That's an important area where the U.S. and Russia, we had started that in the, in the Bush Jr. administration. Uh, and then it sort of fell by the wayside. The second one would be this business of how do we accomplish what we said we wanted to do at the end of the Cold War. Uh, the Charter of Paris for a New Europe in 1990 said that we want to create a Europe from, in effect, let Vancouver to Vladivostok that is inclusive, uh, that is unified, that is cooperative in dealing with security threats. And we've continued to say that regularly over the time, particularly with the o within the OSCE. We did it in December 2012 in the Heads of State Summit in Astana in the OSCE. Again, we said exactly that, what I've just repeated. And yet we've made no progress. We've actually lost ground uh, because of the disputes over where NATO's enlargement or, uh, as I say, the energy issues and uh, number of other conflicts along the way. So that ought to be a second area. And I would argue that the third is for Americans and Russians to talk to one another very seriously about what they not only want to see happen in the Euro-Atlantic region in terms of these many, many issues, not just NATO, and not just the protracted conflicts, and not just gas and oil, uh, but the Arctic and a host of other issues, is what are we thinking about when it comes to the Asia Pacific? Both countries have, Putin uses the word pivot too, pivot to Asia-Pacific and stressing the importance for Russia now of moving in that direction away from what they call last winter's snow, which is the Euro-Atlantic security community. I think we ought to have a very serious discussion about what both of these regions mean in our foreign policy and how we can approach our stake in the two regions in a way that are cooperative rather than competitive. Uh, we don't want the Russians to begin playing games with us with China or allow China to play games using Russia in the context of our relationship. And they have their own concerns along these same lines. So the second thing would be to create an overarching agenda with a few key salient issues that would be part of where we want the relationship to be five years from now. Uh, but again, realistically defined. Uh, third, develop a step-by-step -step process of practical action-oriented things that we can do where we work together and we achieve things in order to begin proving to ourselves that we can do things together. That's one of the reasons why something that very few people know enough about is so important, what is called the Binational U.S.-Russia Presidential Commission. It is only the only commission that exists at the presidential level, even in the relationship with China, we have a formal relationship between cabinet level officials, Secretary of Treasury and their counterpart, Secretary of State counterpart, increasingly Secretary of Defense. But the only presidential commission is this one, and it's got 18 working groups on all kinds of subjects in which they are making a number of important, they're achieving a number of important things. That is criti critical to the relationship. I would argue that both sides, if they're serious about emphasizing cooperation, ought to be featuring those things. You ought to know 
what we're accomplishing together on everything from health to emergency situations to terrorism and a host of other things in these, in these working groups. Uh, but not delay that. Move forward with these practical steps. As somebody once said, someday is not a day of the week. Uh, and the way in which you make progress with this stuff is you get started in practical ways immediately. Uh, then, and I'm almost done with what I have to say to you this evening, is seek a political game changer if it's available. And one is available today. One that would change a critical dynamic in the relationship, and that is missile defense cooperation. Now, I realize I've just gotten to what in the field of security studies and guns and butter and weapons are called MEGOs, M-E-G-O-S. MEGOs are my eyes glaze over. Uh, and this question of what you do with missile defense, I'm afraid, too often becomes a MEGO. But it is critical. If we're going to go down this path of creating a missile defense system to deal with third parties, namely Iran, but when Russia thinks about third parties, they think about Pakistan. I suspect we do too, if you need a missile defense system. And the European version of that, which has been the modified program that Obama introduced called the European Phased Adaptive Approach, the Russians have objected to it because they say it's implausible to us that you're putting this system into Europe to deal with a threat that doesn't yet exist and is not likely ever to reach a point where it could seriously threaten the U.S. with nuclear weapons. Uh, must be designed for us and must be intended as a first step toward de degrading our nuclear deterrent. So they've had all kinds of objections, even though in the context of the NATO-Russia Council and a meeting between the U.S. and Russia, in the, uh, between NATO and Russia in the fall of 2012, they said, yes, we want to work on NATO, uh, we want to work on missile defense and we want to do it cooperatively. Well, at the moment, as I said, missile defense is a perfect representation of Cold War mentality that is still alive and well. So if you can change that and you can create a cooperative missile defense system where the Russians are on the inside rather than the outside, figuring out how they're going to counter it, then you're going to transform much more than the character of that system and create something that's a better system for dealing with the threat. You're going to have to transform the way in which Russia thinks about NATO, the way in which it thinks about political military relations with the West. Final thing I would say is that this, is, this may be a little ivory tower-ish, maybe a little too academic. But I think there's a difference in the problems with Russia between where we have differing interests and where we have conflicting interests. There are issues where we have genuinely conflicting issues. Uh, for example, the Russians want to have, at a minimum, a droit de regard over what happens strategically within the post-Soviet space. They don't want others to be able to come in and dictate. They're not, they don't want to reestablish the empire, the Soviet Union. Uh, but they want to have they want to be the most influential in the post-Soviet space. Uh, and we don't want that. We want this to be outsiders involved in the ways in which they choose. The question is how we cooperate. That's a genuine conflicting interest. We certainly have a conflicting interest in over the way in which we see the need for Russia to uh, behave more constructively and liberally in its domestic development. Uh, and we've been through all kinds of um, all kinds of uh, trouble around these issues, like the Magnitsky legislation in the Senate, and then their retaliation with prohibition of adoption of children by American families, that kind of stuff. Uh, they don't want us dictating what they're doing internally, and we don't like what they're doing internally. That's a genuine conflict of, of interest. But there are a lot of areas where we have differing interests. You take something like, like Iran. Russia does not want Iran to have nuclear weapons. Uh, they genuinely do not. Putin doesn't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. But they disagree over the way in which you deal with it. They dis disagree with over how imminent the threat is, in what form, and they disagree over the tactics on you, how you deal with it. And they certainly would dis disagree with the notion that the ultimate tactic is to attack militarily and take it out preemptively. They would disagree with that. But they don't disagree with what, what, you, with, with, with what the end is. And I think it's very important in designing policy for another power, I don't care what the other country is, that you don't confuse differing interests from conflicting interests. Conflicting interests are the kinds of things where it's very difficult to reach common ground. And therefore, you have to find ways to work around it and mitigate the effect of conflicting interests. Differing interests are where, if you do it well, you probably can reach some common ground. So that'd be the last thing I'd say. I think it was Woody Allen who at one point said that um, 
uh, mankind uh, now stands at a historic crossroads. One path leads to utter despair and total hopelessness, the other to complete extinction. Let us pray that we have the wisdom to make the right choice. <laughs> The question is, it's a messy world. Uh, Russia is indeed important, but when you focus on one part of the world, it's like a tube of toothpaste. You squeeze it too hard, you affect what's going on elsewhere, and often what you do in one part, say by featuring Russia, exacerbates problems that you have elsewhere, presumably dealing with, in this case, the illustration, something like the Arab Spring and what's going on in the Middle East, beyond that, or maybe in the China relationship. I would argue that it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, the whole thrust of what I'm arguing is that we'll be better off in dealing with the rise of the Asia Pacific, of managing the U.S.-China relationship, if we, with the Russians in a strengthened Euro-Atlantic security community, are dealing with the Asia Pacific constructively. Now, if people go about building the U.S.-Russia relationship because we're seeing it as a counterbalance to China, which wouldn't work, they won't do that dance, they won't dance with us that way, uh, any, or that we're building up a Euro-Atlantic security com community as an alternative, let alone an alignment against or a counterbalance to the rise of Asia Pacific, then obviously it's negative. But if the way in which you think about this, and that's what I would argue in talking to the Russians, aren't going to talk about the U.S. and Russia dealing with China or our stakes in the relation with China unless we want to make it a constructive relationship because they're not going to turn their back on the Chinese. They can't afford to do it. We're not going to. The Chinese can't afford the counterbalance the other direction. They're not going to balance with Russia against us. They can't afford to do it. When it comes to more specific issues, say the Middle East, let me put the question to you. Where would we be today if Putin and Lavrov and the Russians were on the same page as us and the French and the British in the Syrian case? What if we were all on the same page? We wouldn't necessarily be able to stop a civil war, but we sure as hell would have a better chance of doing it than we are right now. That's why I said at the outset, the Russians can't prevent us if the, Putin if the Obama administration, which is currently weighing whether they're gonna aid the opposition uh, materially, probably militarily, and the EU has already decided they will under British and French pressure, the Russians can't stop us from doing that, or if the Obama administration were to impose a no-fly zone in Syria, try to do it, they can't stop it. But if we're counting on what Kerry is counting on in these negotiations with Lavrov, find some kind of negotiation between the opposition, the contending parties, and the Assad regime, we have to have a cooperative Russia. The question is, uh, or the point is, that I didn't label Russia a petro-state, and yet most of the characteristics that I described are those of a petro-state. Uh, the point is well taken. Marshall Goldman has a book that's labeled that, Russia the Petro State, and he spends a lot of time talking about it. By the way, if you're interested in this question of Russia energy in a way that goes much beyond just the question of oil and gas, but into the issues that I raised about where Russia's going politically and otherwise, by the person that I think is better informed on this than anything else, uh, it is a book by Thane Gustafson, another Scandinavian name. Thane Gustafson at Georgetown, uh, who, his book is called Wheel of Fortune. I review books for foreign affairs, and I was asked, they've laid out the three best books from or those, that, those of us that review that we thought were the three best. It's one of the three that I've, that I've, that I, that I, and I would recommend it to you. It's a big, thick book, uh, but if you're serious about understanding what's happened to Russia, what's happening to Russia, it's, it's very good, and it certainly makes the point that's behind your observation.